welcome to On Liberty, coming to you live from the Centre for Independent Studies here in Sydney. I'm Glenn Fay, your host for today's episode. On today's episode, why we must follow the educational science. I'm joined for today's session with Professor Emeritus John Sweller. He's from the University of New South Wales, and among his hundreds of publications, he's also the author of two CIS papers, Why Inquiry-Based Approaches Harm Students Learning, and some critical thoughts on critical and creative thinking. Professor Sweller, welcome to the CIS. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Professor, so we can get context for the discussion, I've alluded to your work on inquiry-based approaches to learning. What are we talking about when we talk about inquiry-based approaches? What does this mean in theory and in practice? Right. In, in inquiry learning is a uh, process by which um, we ask students to um, work things out for themselves as much as possible. We don't we we don't give them lots of explicit information because the argument is explicit information isn't processed properly and the best way to learn is to work things out for ourselves. So inquiry learning means, as the term implies, get students to inquire instead of telling them something. But don't we want that? Don't we want students to inquire? We want students to inquire, but we don't need to encourage them to inquire. Inquiring is something that um, we all do, and we do it automatically. We uh, have evolved to do it. It's a natural thing to do. The issue is, is it a good way of learning? And all of the evidence indicates it's not a good way of learning. The best way of learning is not via inquiry, it's via explicit instruction. We have evolved to obtain information from other people. It's arguably the most important evolved characteristic that defines human beings. Doing exactly what we're doing right here and now. We're really, compared to other species, superb at obtaining information from others and under those circumstances it's it's almost peculiar that we want to set up education systems where we don't explicitly provide people with information it's the thing we're really really good at so why why has this happened if why why is it that we have this emphasis on having students learn things for themselves if we've evolved as a species to, to um, you know, best acquire information from others. Right. The argument, when it was first put forward, made eminent sense. It was wrong, but it, it, it made sense given the information we had at the time. Here, here's, here, here's, how, here's an example of how it worked. Look, look at the way in which we learn the really complex tasks of for example, speaking and learn, uh, speaking uh, and listening, listening and speaking. They're, they're arguably the most complex things we do. We don't teach kids how to speak and listen. We don't teach kids, all oh, right, in order to say the word cat, this is the way you organise your tongue and your lips and your breath and your voice. We don't do that. Most of us wouldn't have a clue how to do it. Speech pathologists may be able to do it, but most of us don't. And we don't need to because we pick it up easily and automatically. It's called biologically primary information. There's some information we have evolved to acquire. There's other information which is important to us as a society, but we haven't evolved specifically to acquire it. We can acquire it, but we haven't evolved to acquire it. And because we were unaware of that distinction, the person who pointed it out to us is uh, a guy called David Geary, because we weren't aware of that distinction, we took the view, look how easy it is for people to learn outside of school and how difficult it is to learn in school. Almost everybody learns to listen and speak. Uh, 
large numbers of kids don't learn to read and write, if we only got kids to learn to read and write in the same way as they learn to listen and speak, everything will be better. And that's where discovery learning, inquiry learning, uh, it's got various names, that's, that's where it came from because we looked at how people learn outside of school and they learn these really complex things easily, effortlessly, automatically. And what they didn't realise, we set up schools specifically to teach kids things which they don't learn easily and automatically. And the stuff that's taught in schools, it's not learned easily and automatically. It's learnt consciously and with effort. So why is it that we, that we process information differently? We, you might assume that all information in effect would be processed and learnt in a similar way. Is there anything that we can take away from why some information is acquired more readily and easily and, and why others isn't? Information is acquired readily and easily when it's information that's essential to us as human beings. Reading and writing uh, is, is not one of those things. We, uh, it's immensely beneficial for us to be able to read and write, but until about 100, 150 years ago, only a tiny proportion of the population was able to read and write. Everybody could listen and speak, they couldn't read and write. So because listening and speaking is part of being a human being, there's a whole lot of other things. Uh, being able to think is also part of being a human being. You don't need to teach people how to think. They do it automatically. They may not do it very, very well if they don't have much information, but they do it automatically. There are no, there are no thinking strategies that we've got that we can say, oh, okay, here's a thinking strategy. We've got to teach this. People talk about including thinking strategies in schools and you find that when they talk about it, they never specify what the strategies are that they're talking about. There aren't any. So let's let's get to this then. So that you've alluded to this distinction that we need to identify the difference between those things that uh, we can teach and those things that we can't teach. What happens when we try to teach someone a thinking strategy? What happens when we try to teach people to solve problems uh, without may, perhaps having the underlying knowledge? What's, what happens to that learning process or attempted learning process? Look, the short answer is it simply doesn't work. Uh, you can't teach somebody something they already... Uh, you can't teach something when you can't define what it actually is. Uh, there the, the are basically two ways we acquire knowledge. We can acquire knowledge from other people, which, as I've just been saying, is, is the best way of acquiring knowledge. We're really, really good at it. Or we can acquire knowledge by working it out ourselves. And sometimes we have to acquire knowledge by working it out ourselves. If there's nobody available to tell us, then we've got to work it out ourselves. We're good at doing that, but it's nevertheless a poor way of acquiring knowledge. If you've got a choice between somebody telling you how to do something and working it out yourself, you are far better off having been told how to do it, how it works, what you're supposed to do, than trying to work it out ourselves. We can work it out ourselves, but sometimes something that you can be told in literally a few minutes may take you a few years, literally a few years to work out. Uh, that, that's why we engage in research. We engage in research because there's nobody to tell us the answers to the questions we have. If there was, you wouldn't need to do the research. So thanks for everyone that's joining the conversation so far. A reminder to plug your questions into the chat box so we can get to those through the conversation. A uh, question from Anthony. Does the emphasis on inquiry learning imply everyone has to return to a year zero? Look, in a way, I guess it does. I, 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 haven't, I haven't thought about it in those terms, but that's, uh, that sounds like a, a, a reasonable thing, that uh, year zero is uh, where we were before we 
new anything. Uh, it, 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 it assumes, look, we don't know anything and we've got to work it all out ourselves. We cannot possibly do that. I might add in the early days of inquiry learning, it was initially called discovery learning, we expected students to discover things with almost no help at all. People realised fairly quickly, look, you know, that, that is absolutely disastrous. You can't expect kids to uh, recapitulate all of human civilization in a few years at school. So then we said, oh, look, we still want them to inquire, but we'll give them some assistance. And what you find is, yeah, if you give them assistance, they learn better. The more assistance you give them, the better they learn. So the the, the complaint that some, some make in this space is that while having an explicit approach might be suitable for certain kinds of things, maybe, uh, you know, I guess foundational facts, this sort of thing, um, it may not be suitable for other types of um, questions or problems, things that maybe require more of a conceptual basis. Is it is the inquiry an explicit direction? Does it differ based on whether we're talking about procedures or concepts? No, it doesn't. Um, uh, the best way to learn a concept in the first instance is to have it explained to you. Now, do you then need to think about it? Yeah, of course you need to think about it. Somebody uh, uh, explains a concept uh, and you do nothing more, then it's not going to work. But the same applies for a procedure. You need to be shown a procedure. And once you're shown the procedure, you need to think about it, you need to study it, and then you need to practice it. Same with a concept. You know, when, when um, most of the concepts that we learn in school are really relatively simple. It's the procedures that are difficult. Now, it's, uh, uh, um, if, you, if, you, if you try looking at a concept that's taught in school, most of them tend to be extremely simple. Uh, you know, concepts like, okay, when you look at the earth, it looks flat. It's not. It's round. It's a globe. Well, that's the concept. Having said that, what else do you do? <laughs> so, look, we've been talking about school education and the implication for the classroom. But it strikes me that what you're talking about is a learning framework that is much broader than, than schools and of children. In what ways does the discussion that you, that you raise here, to what extent is that generalizable to all learning? It's, uh, it, it's completely generalizable. We, we, we have the same cognitive system, whether we're sitting in school or whether we're in the workplace or wherever we are. Um, uh, you, you, you can see that most clearly in that the, uh, the uh, think of a professional like a, 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 a medical professional. Uh, we, we, we're dealing more heavily with medical professionals in the last year or two. Uh, it's, uh, if, 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 if you go to a doctor one of the major issues you want to consider is the experience of that doctor. Now, what do we mean by experience? Well, we mean, what do they actually know? If you, if you have somebody operating on you, would you prefer somebody who's operating on you who, when a problem arises, looks at it and says, oh, I know that problem I've seen that before I know what to do in that situation this is what this is what the problem is this is what you do about it it's all in the surgeon's long-term memory or would you prefer a surgeon who's a really good problem solver and looks at it and say wow I haven't seen this before I wonder what I ought to do here should I try this no that'll probably kill the patients I don't want to do that perhaps I should try something else 
you do not want a surgeon like that. Uh, you do not want a surgeon who has taken a course in problem solving. You want a surgeon who's taken a course in the relevant area of surgery. And the same goes for just about everybody we, de we deal with from car mechanics to uh, relationship experts. You want somebody who's got a lot of information and long-term memory and for whom whatever problem you come up with, they've seen it before. That's another way of saying you want an expert, you want somebody who's experienced. So we have a difference then between how we approach learning if something's new to us and how we approach learning something if we've already got some uh, and pre-existing knowledge, I guess. I think what we're, what we're dancing around is effectively the implications around cognitive load theory. This is something that, that you've written about and researched on for decades um, and, and in large part famed with uh, its formulation and, and, um, and testing. Give us a little bit of an idea of what cognitive load theory means and its implications. It's based on a particular view of human cognitive architecture. Let me briefly uh, uh, describe that. The, the, the five basic principles, I've, I've talked about two of them uh, earlier on. How do we acquire information? We can acquire it either through inquiry, through problem solving, or we can get it from somebody else. We've evolved to uh, uh, obtain information uh, both ways, but the best way is to get information from other people if it's available. Once we've acquired information, it needs to be processed and it's first processed in a very limited working memory. Limited in capacity and duration, we can hold no more than about two, three, four, maybe a bit more elements of information in working memory, novel information in working memory, and they'll only stay there for about 20 seconds without, uh, uh, without practice, without repetition. Information that's useful to you is then switched over to a long-term memory. And unlike working memory, long-term memory has no limitations that we know of. It's uh, unlimited in capacity and in duration. And the more information we get into that long-term memory, the more expert we are. So that, that's where the expertise comes from. Lots and lots of information in long-term memory. That's what I'm talking about a surgeon who's an expert. Same thing with a, a teacher who's an expert. Lastly, that information can be transferred back from long-term memory into working memory. And when that happens, we are transformed. And we're transformed because when information is taken from long-term memory back into working memory, working memory has no limits. The limits I described before for, of capacity and duration, they disappear. There are no limits to the amount of information we can get from long-term memory. Education is transformational. For that reason, that's why. Once information has gone into long-term memory, we become different people. We can do things, we can think about things, we can assess things, which we couldn't possibly do before. The goal of education has to be to get lots of information in long-term memory. Once information gets into long-term memory, it needs to be, um, in a way, solidified there, and that means practice. So... Don't give people problems to solve when they're just learning. Tell them. Once they've understood the material, once they uh, are able to do it by thinking about it, then they need to do a lot, lot more practice. At that point, they can practice problem solving. The practice is to make everything automatic. Um, it's very useful to us, for example, to be able to instantly know and say, without thinking, $7 plus $5 is $12. Now, there's a lot of those facts that we've got to learn, 
a lot of procedures we've got to learn. But it makes an enormous difference to us if we've got that sort of information in long-term memory. We can use that to solve complex problems, much more complex problems. If we've got to sit there and think, oh, seven plus five, what, what does that equal? Oh, look, I could work it out on my fingers. Oh, it, it equals 12. If you've got to do that. You can't use it to solve problems. Mm. So for those of us that I speak for probably a lot of people that when it comes to the end of a semester at university or it comes to HSC time and it comes to preparing for an exam and they, you try to cram a whole lot of information in and you wonder why it doesn't seem to really stick. How do we explain this? Right. Nothing we learn or very little that we learn sticks if it's not continuously used. You can learn something, you can learn it up for an exam, and if it's stuff which you're never going to use again, you'll be able to relearn it easily, but it won't stick, it won't stay there. Uh, the things that we that stay in long-term memory are things that we use all the time. If it's not practised, it slowly fades away. There is, there is forgetting, in other words, but... Uh, not complete forgetting because if you don't use something and then realise later on, oh, look, I need to use it. I need to relearn this. It's much quicker relearning it the second time round and the third time round than it was the first time round. So we've got, we've got to talk a little bit here about the direction that a lot of school systems take. And this is around where the relevant focus should be particularly in the 21st century context. So uh, it's often claimed that in the 21st century, we no longer need knowledge because information is available at our fingertips. And from the discussion we're having, it's clear that there, there's some implications around why it's important to have that knowledge ourselves. But I want to delve into the, a related issue to that and because the implication of, of that assumption is that therefore we should focus on higher order skills, things like creativity, critical thinking, metacognition, these sorts of things. And I want to talk a little bit about creativity and critical thinking, because I know that they're two issues that, that you've produced in a, in a recent paper for us as well. Let's go to creativity first. So it's often talked about that creativity is a catalyst for obviously artistic creation, but also for entrepreneurialism and, and innovation. Do How do we actually promote those things that we're looking for, those outcomes we're looking for around creativity? And where do we go wrong with it? We went wrong with it by assuming that we can be creative without knowledge. Uh, ultimately, the only thing we can teach is knowledge. Now, by knowledge, I don't mean, you know, isolated facts. We've got an enormous amount of knowledge in long-term memory, I mean, we, you and I wouldn't be able to hold this conversation without an immense amount of knowledge. And without that knowledge, we can't be creative. There, there, there really is no such thing as a ignorant, creative person. When you look at uh, anybody who's created anything that's of value to us, they've spent years working on it. It's not something that, that comes from, from nowhere. They've got knowledge that allows them to be able to, uh, to work in the way in which uh, they have in order to be creative. If you ask somebody, uh, well, some... some some people insist we ought to be teaching general creativity and thinking skills. If you ask them, okay, what creative critical thinking strategies have you been taught that you think ought to be taught to students? The answer is silence. There are none. 
I like to think I'm creative. Do I have any strategies I can tell people how to be creative? Not a single one. Other than acquiring lots of knowledge in the area in which you're working. If, if, if you want somebody to be able to think critically in the sense of, okay, somebody's told me this and it doesn't make sense, it's wrong. You know it doesn't make sense. You know it's wrong if you've got factual knowledge about that area. If somebody starts talking to me about epidemiology, I can't critically think about epidemiology. I don't know enough. And the same goes for almost everything else that we're asked to critically think about. We can critically think about things when we're knowledgeable about them. If somebody comes along and says to me something which makes no sense at all because of the knowledge that I have, then I can critically think. If somebody comes to me and speaks absolute nonsense about something I know nothing about, I can't turn around and say, that is nonsense. It's knowledge that allows us to critically think. And there are no strategies. I'm willing to be proved wrong. So all somebody has to do is come up, up with a critical thinking strategy, a general critical thinking strategy, and demonstrate, look, if we teach this to students, they're changed. Hasn't happened. And, and this is not new. You know, people say, oh, this is new. It's 21st century. Not 21st century. It's been going on for millennia. <laughs> well, let's take one of the elements that is that appears to be new, or at least it's discussed as if it were new. And this is this issue of misinformation, disinformation. Part of that's attributed, of course, to the wealth of information available, through social media channels, these sorts of things. And it's often claimed that the solution to misinformation effectively is that school systems in particular should help students to um, know how to think rather than what to think. And this is assumed to be, therefore, uh, a justification for promoting so-called generic and general critical thinking skills. Is what is, what is the solution to disinformation and misinformation? I, I have no idea how I would go about determining that something is misinformation unless I knew what was valid and what was invalid in that particular area. How in the world, if somebody tells me, uh, you know, you, you get onto areas like climate change, if, so, if somebody tells me, oh, climate change has this effect or climate change has that effect or it's caused by this or it's caused by that, there's no way I can assess their statements and say, no, no, climate change, that statement concerning climate change is wrong and this one is, is, is right, unless I know about climate change. There simply is no way of assessing that without knowledge. So the solution is if you want somebody to critically evaluate statements on climate change, you, you have to teach them about climate change and you have to be confident that what you're teaching them is actually accurate. And sometimes it may be accurate and sometimes it may not be accurate and sometimes what we're told now uh, we realise later on is wrong. Uh, climate change is science and despite what people say about the science is settled. No science is ever settled mm. in any area. The reason why science is so incredibly important and effective is precisely because it's never settled. We'll keep that in mind when we talk through pandemic and, and information regarding that too. I'm sure there's some lessons in all that. 
Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. Professor Sweller, thanks so much for joining us for the program. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Coming up next week, Stanford University's Catherine Stoner. She'll be talking about Russia and the Ukraine crisis. I hope you'll join us then.